This is our fifth annual Theodore Roosevelt Symposium. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled with the turnout tonight and with this year's registration. If you haven't registered and you want to come to events tomorrow, they're free, of course. There's a registration fee if you want to come to the banquet tomorrow night and on the field trip and so on, and you can register after this event tonight or tomorrow morning, but we're just delighted that you're here. I'm Clay Jenkinson. I'll be the host and moderator for the next couple of days. And our theme this time is Theodore Roosevelt, the president in the arena. And it's my um, great honor tonight to introduce Perry Arnold, who is our keynote um, speaker. But let me begin by welcoming you on behalf of President Richard McCallum. Uh, Dr. McCallum so wanted to be here tonight, but there's a mandatory State Board of Higher Education meeting up in Botano, and he felt compelled to be there. He'll be here in the morning. But he asked me to greet you on his behalf and to welcome you to this campus. You'll hear a lot more in the next 72 hours about the Theodore Roosevelt Center. The Theodore Roosevelt Center has been in existence now for four years. Here's what we're doing in a nutshell. We've decided to digitize every known scrap of Roosevelt's writings. Roosevelt was the writingest president in American history. He wrote 40 books, depending upon how you count, and innumerable articles. And the, the paper trail of his presidency is immense, not as immense, say, as that of Bill Clinton or Richard Nixon, but for his time it was gigantic. And we are going to digitize every scrap of all of the historical documents relating to Roosevelt, cartoons, scrapbooks, photographs, films, audio, Whatever there is that is that can be called Rooseveltiana, we here at the Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State are going to digitize it, we're going to catalog it, we're going to index it, and we're going to make it available to the world. So that you could be in, a, in your bathrobe or pajamas in Tampa or Trieste and 24 hours a day search the Roosevelt Papers and get the benefits not just of everything that's in the Library of Congress relating to Roosevelt, but everything that's at Harvard relating to Roosevelt and everything in the National Park Service relating to Roosevelt and much more down to the Glendive Montana Historical Museum. And so we're absolutely thrilled about that and you'll be seeing some of the fruits of that over the next couple of days. You know, Roosevelt, the president, that's our theme. He was an accidental president in that he came through the back door. Uh, he was vice president of the United States and when uh, President McKinley was shot on September 6, 1901, and died a week later. Roosevelt ascended into the presidency. He was the youngest president in American history, 42 years and 322 days at the time of his inauguration. He served as president for seven years and 171 days. One of his deepest desires was to be elected in his own right. He did not want, he said, to go down in history as an asterisk. He wanted to be elected as president himself, and he worked very hard at it at a time when it was not really acceptable for a sitting president to campaign on his own behalf. You'll hear a little bit more about that tomorrow. And he had reason to be anxious about this because there had been four previous vice presidents who had ascended to the presidency on the assassination or death of the sitting president, and not one of them had become president in his own right. Uh, John Tyler uh, became president in 1842 on the death of William Henry Harrison. Uh, he did not run for election. Zachary Taylor died in office in 1850. His vice president, Millard Fillmore, became acting president. He lost the nomination when he ran. Andrew Johnson uh, became president after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865. As you know, he was impeached but not convicted, and he was not nominated for a term in his own right. And Chester Arthur became president in 1881 after the assassination of James Garfield, and he was not nominated to serve a term in his own right. So when Roosevelt looked at this phenomenon of vice presidents who have ascended to the presidency, it gave him a sense of gloom and desperation. Well, as you know, he was elected in his own right in 1904. It was the largest majority in the Electoral College up until that time and the largest plurality in the popular vote up until that time. He regarded that as a resounding endorsement of himself and his policies. 
We say he was an accidental president, but he appears to us to be a natural. I mean, think of the qualities that Theodore Roosevelt brought to the office. I think it would be fair to say that he brought a unique um, combination of qualities to his presidency. He may have been intellectually the best prepared president in American history. Certainly he ranks with John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in that category. He read a book a day all of his life. Uh, he was a deeply read man. In fact, after his presidency, he went on a kind of grand tour of Europe, and he lectured in Germany at German universities on German literature in German. Um, that can be said of no other president in American history. You know, John Kennedy was able to squeak out, Ich bin ein Berliner for which he was regarded as a Renaissance man, uh, Theodore Roosevelt could actually speak German, and he read German literature deeply. So intellectually, he was a very well-prepared man. He was also a bona fide war hero, like Ulysses S. Grant and um, President Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy and a few others. His time in Dakota had been extraordinarily important to this. He had come out here and effectively refashioned himself in a very self-conscious way. He came out as a New York aristocrat with a Harvard degree and a Harvard accent and some snobbery born of that uh, birth and upbringing. And he came here deliberately to immerse himself in the frontier life in the manner of his friend and um, hero, Frederick Jackson Turner. And he refashioned himself as a rancher and a cowboy and a frontiersman. And that certainly served him throughout his career. Something I read in Perry Arnold's book adds a fourth element. He had already achieved great administrative mastery. He had been, for six years, a US Civil Service Commissioner. He had been uh, the, the president of the New York uh, Police Commission. And he had served as governor of New York. We think of him as a consummate politician and war hero. But he had already achieved extraordinary administrative mastery before he became president. And finally, he was not afraid of power. Uh, either constitutionally or temperamentally. Um, Thomas Jefferson, for example, was both temperamentally and constitutionally afraid of executive power. Um, no such inhibition or diffidence lived in the breast of Theodore Roosevelt. And so he brought a combination of qualities unique up until that time and probably unique in the history of the United States. We regard him as a natural. But not everybody did. As you probably know, when he was nominated for the vice presidency um, in the McKinley uh, election campaign of 1900, the kingmaker of Ohio, Mark Hanna, who had helped to make McKinley president, said, and I quote, now look what you've done. Now there is only one life between that madman and the presidency. And he actually told McKinley that McKinley's duty was to keep breathing for the next four years. And after McKinley's assassination, Mark Hanna, upon watching the ascent of Theodore Roosevelt, said, I told you so. Now that damned cowboy is the president of this country. So that by way of, um, I hope, setting up our discourse for the next couple of days in which we examine Roosevelt's presidency in a whole range of perspectives. We're so honored tonight to have Perry Arnold to provide our keynote address. He has a BA from Roosevelt University in Chicago, a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. In 1993 and 94, he was a visiting Compton research professor at the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. He has many articles, but two books, Remaking the Presidency, Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, published in 2009. And by the way, when this program ends tonight, He'll be in the lobby at our reception. We invite all of you to stay. You can buy this book, and he'll sign it for you if you wish. Remaking the Presidency, Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, 1901 to 1916. I'm going to end my introduction by reading a short paragraph from it. And his other book is Making the Managerial Presidency, which was published in 1986, and which won the Academy of Public Administration's 1987 Brownlow Award. Uh, we are so glad to have him here tonight. Let me just give you one little piece of flavor of the book. This is from his conclusion about Theodore Roosevelt from page 68. Uh, Professor Arnold writes, Roosevelt became a highly visible public communicator. 
and he associated his public image with his policy agenda. In other words, we might think of Roosevelt as innovatively making the presidency a stage, not just a bully pulpit, upon which he would model the importance of his policy goal. Past presidents understood the office's symbolic importance, but Roosevelt was the first to use that office's symbolic possibilities to promote substantive policy goals. That is most obvious in the case of the United States Navy. His self-presentation as the heroic warrior gave him a potent veracity in promoting naval strength. His actions in assembling fleet-level exercises, which he attended, made publicly visible the grandeur of naval power. Finally, of course, the remarkable chutzpah, to use a most appropriate word, of ordering the Atlantic fleet to sail around the world by way of the West Coast and then Japan at a time of unsettled international relations was a gesture of operatic grandeur. Please welcome Professor Perry Arnold. Thank you, Clay. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here um, and have people say nice things about my book. Um, you know, before I start, um, foreign languages and presidents, I don't speak German, but I, have, I am told by colleagues who do speak German that, and some of you probably heard this, that um, John Kennedy's Ich bin a Berliner refers to a jelly donut called a Berliner. So if that's true, he stood bravely at the wall and said, I'm a jelly donut. So, but check that. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I've never been to the Badlands or to um, Western North Dakota, and so I was pleased as punch to get this invitation. And I want to thank uh, Clay Jenkinson and the organizers of the symposium for inviting me. Uh, I want to thank Sharon Kilzer for the um, logistics of bringing myself and the other uh, scholars from afar uh, to um, Dickinson, and I want to thank you all for being here, and uh, particularly perhaps the students who've been forced to be here. There must be some of you out there. Um, um, being a teacher, I know well what it's like to force students to come to lectures. I hope that I make it not too painful for those students. Um, well, what are we going to talk about in terms of this unusual president that um, Clay just described? Uh, in, uh, the, I've titled my talk, um, a novel president, because what I want to stress is that what is, strike, what is so striking about Roosevelt is not just his personal peculiarities and interesting features that we could go on and on about, but what is even more interesting, I want to suggest, has an institutional quality to it. That is, there's no president like him before him. There's a novel presidency, not just a novel president. And that's what's, that question, how does he get to be a novel president, in a way, is what drew me to the project that led to the book that Clay described. Um, what we might say about Roosevelt is that um, he comes out of nowhere with a set of behaviors that we sometimes, you've heard this, will refer to as like a modern president. But that's the paradox. He's not a modern president. The presidency was not a modern presidency. So th the interesting puzzle is, where did he get the wherewithal, the resources, and the opening, so to speak, in political space to become that extraordinarily unusual president. Let me begin this way, to try to kind of place him in our historical memory. How many of us, except for the historians amongst us, how many of us have a mental picture of those presidents between um, Lincoln and uh, 1901, Theodore Roosevelt? How many of us could think of, and have a picture of Hayes, a picture of um, McKinley? Um, I mean, with some detail. We have a picture, I suspect, for most of us, it's this dour gray man who, when he spoke, if he spoke at all, tended to talk in a kind of formalism, 
about the greatness of America and the Constitution. And then Roosevelt comes along, and Roosevelt's radically different. Now, he's, he's radically different, I, I, I want to suggest, initially, in the most plain way. We have an image of this man. That's an, a, whoops, sorry. Um, that's a familiar picture to us. That is, we, we, we understand this toothy, uh, aggressive, smart, and policy-driven president as somebody we have in our historical memory as an important president. Well, that's another way of saying this is a novel president, very different than his predecessors. So my job for tonight is to talk about this puzzle a bit and try to explain it, at least try to get some purchase on what makes Roosevelt novel. Um, first of all, what made what makes him different is not, I want to suggest, obvious. We might initially think, I'm going to speak this tongue in cheek, we might think we have an explanation. The explanation is a testosterone hypothesis. He was more manly. He was more the cowboy. He was more aggressive than prior presidents. But that doesn't get us very far. Um, and it's, it, it begs the question. Um, now, I think there is a personal story here and a psychological dimension to the story so that um, we should think seriously about, Will's, about Roosevelt's biography. And you folks, more than most people, can do that. After all, part of the Roosevelt story is right here, is the Badlands. And the Badlands does shape this president's political persona. But that's not a sufficient explanation by itself. We have to go farther than that. Um, what, what led Roosevelt to not just become a kind of imperial rancher in the Badlands? What happened, what brought him to the White House? And that's the more complicated story. First of all, what I want to suggest to you is I want to use two simple models, two simple sketches of the presidency to suggest that something dramatic had happened in that very small space between McKinley and Roosevelt. So what I want to suggest, and this is the kind of distinction that political scientists use and historians um, blanch at. So you have to excuse me. Um, I want to describe Roosevelt's predecessors as presidents of the party period. Now, it, we might quickly think McKinley, um, Harrison, Cleveland. Cleveland vetoed a lot, and he's kind of famous for that. But he vetoed a lot because he was a failing president. And he was using that negative power because he had no other power. And he was using it largely for partisan purposes against patronage, Republican patronage. So these, are, these look like presidents who don't have much of, a, of an impact in American politics. That's a mistake. What we misunderstand is they're different, they represent a different kind of institution. These are presidents whose primary responsibility is in relationship to their own parties. They are managers of faction. They are extraordinarily experienced electoral politicians, electoral experts, so to speak. And their job was to be loyal to their parties and to generate the resources of the national government in ways that sustain and strengthen their parties. They were not advocates of policy. But one might want to quickly note, so list the policies of the federal government circa 1885. Well, there's not a lot. But largely, they're policies that are distributive, supporting the railroads with land grants, giving away land through the Homestead Act, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, the national state was not yet regulatory. And so these are party politicians in a party political universe. Roosevelt wasn't. And that's, I think, the marked difference. Personality aside, Roosevelt enters the office and takes it as something else. Now, that suggests then that it's not enough to talk about Roosevelt. We have to talk about his context. That the personal skills, the personality of this president itself 
don't, aren't enough to speak ludicrously. So what would Lincoln be if Lincoln occupied the presidency when Cal Coolidge did? Well, he wouldn't be Lincoln, right? Context is really crucial to understanding leadership. So what's Roosevelt's context? Well, it's, it, it, it's very quickly, it's not the party period. So that Roosevelt enters the presidency at a moment that is a seam itself between this dominant mass parties and an, an emergent pluralist political and economic system. Parties don't disappear. They remain important, but they become competitors with interest groups in a much, much more diffracted and interestingly complicated modern political system, one that looks rather like our political system today. And Roosevelt was the right politician for that system. And so this is a key part of my argument. I want to fit Roosevelt's background and skills with that new context. So here's my hypothesis. It's a counterfactual, so I can't be wrong, right? If McKinley had not been shot by an anarchist in, um, in Buffalo in 1901, nothing would have changed. He would have remained, context be damned, he would have remained McKinley. There would have been rather, rather little difference in the way the presidency was used in 1901, two, and three, because he couldn't recognize the context. His background was the party period. Now, what does that mean? A few markers. So think about this. What, what did every president from after Andrew Johnson to Theodore Roosevelt, except for Cleveland, share. They were major officers in the Civil War. They were, uh, so to speak, heroes of the bloody shirt. Uh, they, uh, th so they're men who came to their political maturity in the context of saving the Union. And that, of course, is the foundation of the Republican Party. And so the Republican Party for them certainly was a patronage machine but it was a patronage machine with a soul, and the soul was the union. And that's their political universe. And preserving that party and maintaining it against those Democrats, the party of the South, the party of, of, of disloyalty and disunion, was this grand political project. There were also, every one of them, of course, an elective politician, men who'd spent their whole careers seeking office. And then along comes Theodore Roosevelt, a babe during the Civil War, who, except for several one-year terms at the beginning of his political career in the New York State Assembly, um, which were, were marked, by the way, by his conflict with party bosses and party regulars, except for that, he held no elective office until the governorship of New York. In other words, his whole public career is non-elective and administrative. And what I want to point out is that if there is a characteristic of government that is parallel to the emergence of this post-party period system, it is the rise of the American administrative state, the beginnings of the civil service, the beginning of expert uh, agencies like the Forest Service. Um, and that's the system that Theodore Roosevelt had been socialized into. He'd worked in it. He'd held important offices in it. And so he enters the American political scene and the executive branch in the presidential role at exactly the time that it was open to somebody with his skills and sensibilities so as to create a new kind of president. So McKinley couldn't have, but Roosevelt could, because he understood it. Now, that's the beginning of an explanation, I think. But why, why did he take the opportunity to become so different a president than McKinley had? Why did he become a pursuer of public policies that no pre of the sort no president had ever sought before, like antitrust, 
um, it's because the context is not only one of a changing organizational structure of interests and power, it's also what we all know as the progressive era. It's a period of increasing dissatisfaction on the part of middle Americans with the nature of American society and economy. Um, so let me, let me say a few more things about that system. Um, so what is the progressive period? What do we mean by it? Let me quote a um, distinguished historian uh, from a, a book of his on the progressive era. He says, in this rapidly changing economy and society, circa 1900, at um, the turn of the century, middle class man and woman, radicalized and resolute, were, re were ready to sweep aside the power of the rich and build a new progressive America. In other words, it was a period when people like you and me were being radicalized. Now, radicalized in interesting ways, not so as to go out and build the barricades, but radicalized rather, as McGeer has it, to try to make all of America middle class, to try to create stability and order and good schools and, or and fine communities that all Americans should live that way. And the rich don't and the poor don't, and they must be changed. And a significant point of change is the American economy. So what are the main targets of anxiety here? Well, first, the so-called trusts. That is, these economic organizations that monopolized industries. This is a period in which the American economy very rapidly became dominated by very few firms. So there weren't tobacco companies. There was the Tobacco Trust, American Tobacco Company. There weren't sugar companies, sugar refiners. There was the Sugar Trust. There, there, wasn't, there weren't many steel companies. There was Carnegie and then U.S. Steel. And then you know about oil. There were oil companies, and then there's Standard. And so over a period of 1898 to 1902, there are 2,653 mergers of companies in the American economy. And this is what was called the trust process. These companies were essentially or organized under an overarching board and management and coordinated, in effect, for monopolistic purposes. Americans looked at that and said, there's nothing good about that. This leads to higher prices. This leads to even more uh, misuse of labor. Um, and this leads to a society very much like one we do not want to be part of. A second related issue was the tariff, a, a term that seems really archaic to us. There are, we don't use the term any longer. We do use some taxes that are, look like tariffs, but they're actually out of fashion. We are all free traders today, right? Well, we weren't free traders at the turn of the century. We weren't free traders through most of the 19th century. Rather, we used the tariff to protect American manufacturing. But progressives said, look at those trusts. We're protecting them. So the, so the, so the tariff becomes the mother of the trusts, this, protect, this wall of protection. But yet the Republican Party's um, holy shroud was the tariff. It was the central real policy aim that had tied together the Republican Party protection of American manufacturing. And that's, this becomes an extremely troubling issue during the uh, progressive period. Um, and then corruption. Not hard to imagine at this period. Cities were corrupt. The national government was corrupt. Business owned much of government at every level. The Senate, remember the Senate, prior to the 17th Amendment, is appointed by the state legislatures. And what that really meant in most cases was very rich people bought Senate seats for themselves, distributed money to the state legislatures. And the Senate was a corrupt place. And that became increasingly widely known. Another aspect of the progressive era that we would recognize is it's a period in which national magazines become important, just as they are today. So people would buy magazines that would have stories like the shame of the Senate. That is close journalism 
following the, 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 the evidence of corruption in the Senate, for example. And then there's waste of natural resources, as in the context of the end of the frontier, Americans saw the world, the, 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 the country being one of increasingly now limited resources, um, tainted food and drugs, and so, and the list goes on. These waves of new immigrants coming in were very unsettling to middle class people. They were uneducated, they brought violence to the cities, et cetera. So there had to be change, but who was going to bring change? That's Roosevelt's opening. It's that agenda of issues that give Roosevelt, as this novel kind of president, the opportunity to break with his party in many respects and to, it's not an overstatement, I think, to say, to become the first president who operates as if the presidency is an independent political institution, apart from a tie to party, unlike the party period presidents. So, now, if we look back at that, at the years before Roosevelt, it, 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 it will strike us that these issues were at stake in the election of 1896. They were spoken to by the Democrats and William Jennings Bryan, a populist. And those appeals were not interesting to middle class Americans. They were Western, they were, um, they were agrarian, they spoke to the unsophisticated. And so McKinley, of course, wins in a lands relative landslide in 1896, and the Republicans pay little attention to those issues. And Roosevelt enters in 1901, and it's a different kind of president. And these issues become central for him. Now, um, so at one and the same time, Roosevelt saw an opportunity in the economic reform anxieties of the progressive era to address issues that had been unaddressed, and in doing so, to build a constituency for his own presidency. Not to simply appeal to Republicans, but to be the progressive president. Um, and in doing so, he in fact built that constituency and became what we might call the first personal president. That is, the first president who uses the office in a way that is a personification of himself. Now, Finally, I want to turn to a couple of cases of his policy innovation to try to deal with the question of how did he do this. Keep in mind, the presidency, will, we might say that Roosevelt looks modern, but the modern presidency is an institution of, with a White House and executive office staff of about 2,000 people. Roosevelt had two secretaries, and then some servants and some clerks. In other words, there is no presidency yet of an institutional organized way, a sense like the modern presidency. So how did Roosevelt achieve efficacy? So I want to use two cases very briefly to try to track this. The first is um, uh, antitrust. Um, so we all know there's a Sherman Act, right, 1890. Um, it's the Antitrust Act. But the Sherman Act, in many respects, was an empty shirt. Um, there were 18 Sherman Act cases between 1890 and 1901. Four of them, if I recall, are against labor unions. So there are 14 involving business. None of those cases were brought by the Attorney General or essentially out of the top of the administration. They were all initiated by U.S. attorneys in the, in the states. So the Sherman Act hadn't been used as a piece of national policy. It, in many ways, was itself a symbolic gesture to earlier Granger disconcerns. So Roosevelt, in his first annual message, December 1901, says, shockingly for a Republican, we have to address this problem of great corporations and but not to eliminate them. That would be the populist solution. We have to regulate them. We have to watch over them. And that was a shocking thing to say. There was business disconcern, business was discomforted by that. There were editorials um, uh, against Roosevelt in this regard. 
And then, shockingly in February 1902, he did something that hadn't been done before. He and his attorney general announced an antitrust suit under the Sherman Act. And it was, ag it was against one of J.P. Morgan's trusts, the Northern Securities Company. This was a trust put together to end competition on the northern routes of the transcontinental railroads. There were two main lines serving Minnesota, the Dakotas, and they were in competition with each other, which meant they couldn't maximize their profits. In fact, they were in both financial trouble. J.P. Morgan's solution was a monopoly. We'll, we'll join them. That was the basis of the North, Northern security suit. This is a violation of antitrust. The, con the, the, the response to that was um, horrifying, that this, um, this cowboy, this, let me flash up, uh, this, um, this uh, rough rider who rode up the hill to make himself a name now is going to ride up the hill against American business. That this is nothing but a kind of clown and a dangerous one. The Mark Hanna story about Roosevelt. Roosevelt consulted with nobody except his attorney general Knox about this suit, um, which itself was curious. It fits the fact that he had no staff. Who was he going to consult? What, J.P. Morgan? But the background of this is, as governor of New York, he was governor of New York after the Cuban story, so that he came back with his uniform as a hero and got elected governor. As governor, he initiated antitrust policy with consultation of a number of leading economists. And so he already had the expertise to do this, and he was confident of it, which would distinguish him from any of his predecessors. He actually knew something about policy, and he initiated the suit. Now, th th this story is complicated by the complications of antitrust, early antitrust law. Let me just say one thing about it that I think underlines how adventurous Roosevelt was. If we ask most lawyers in 1902, could you undertake this suit? they would have said probably not, because the Supreme Court had greatly weakened the Sherman Act in a case called um, Knight versus U.S., uh, which the Sugar Trust was found not to be in violation of the Sherman Act. So that this didn't look like a very smart suit, but Roosevelt was convinced that this was going to not only be victorious, but that this would clarify the Sherman Act and would do something else. It would bring antitrust into the executive branch. It would be another weapon of the presidency, his presidency particularly. Now, a couple of interesting things that I want to mention about um, the, um, uh, the um, innovations entailed in the Northern Securities case, something that just I guess charm is the right word. Something that charmed me enormously about Roosevelt at this point is that an opening occurred in the Supreme Court. Now, at this point, the Supreme Court filled on the criteria of partisanship. A president appoints a judge of his own party. That's not different. Two, um, regional, well, state identity, so that a... Um, a Massachusetts judge retiring ought to be replaced by a, Massachusetts, a judge from Massachusetts. And there's little, there's really nothing in the history of the court and the president in the 19th century to suggest that there's much by way of policy intent. But we get the first case, I think, or at least the first case I've ever seen, of a, um, a, a policy regarding appointment, a results-oriented appointment. So Roosevelt, in his correspondence uh, with friends, is considering Oliver Wendell Holmes for the court. And he's saying to his friends, you know, I think this is the right guy. He'll rule the way I want him to rule, in northern securities, in labor cases, because he is 
a moderate to a liberal judge. And he appoints Oliver Wendell Holmes. Of course, Roosevelt's great chagrin was that Holmes voted against him on northern securities. But nevertheless, Roosevelt won. And Roosevelt, by the way, never felt friendly to Holmes again. He was a man who carried a grudge. But most important is the, is the kind of, is the kind of uh, presumption that we see in Roosevelt, that appointments to the court ought to be modeled on the basis of presidential policy um, goals, rather than thinking of the court as a totally independent branch. Now, boy, that sounds modern, doesn't it? Um, now, with the victory in Northern Securities, Roosevelt, in effect, makes antitrust an executive branch priority and a, an executive branch tool. Now, the result of all this was shocking to the business community. Stocks had fallen when the suit was announced, um, when, um, Harper's, Harper's Weekly showed this cartoon, not totally sure that it liked this Roosevelt, the line tamer of corporations. The New York Times editorialized, um, if corporate enterprise in this country is to be dependent hereafter for the untrammeled conduct of its business, not upon the plain reading of statutes, but upon the will of a president? So, is, is, is presidential discretion now going to be the rule that guides the economy? So we see some of the same references and ideas about presidential power and discretion that we see in later American history about presidential power and discretion. And so Roosevelt, in this sense too, Roosevelt seems to be breaking modern ground in some respects. But again, he was doing it alone. He had no staff. He had, what he had was an enormous amount of presumption that he could do it. And in fact, he managed it. Second case, um, I want to move reasonably quickly uh, so we have time to talk. Um, naval modernization, Clay mentioned that. Um, another extremely unusual character of Roosevelt's presidency is he engaged with the Navy. No president had ever done that. Now, the Navy had had um, administrations that had brought some change. There was a point at which ships were, had steam engines. Now, they didn't put their sails away because the Navy was really committed to having both sails and steam, but they got steam engines. Um, there was a point later that some armor was put on some Navy ships. So there was change, but no president had ever been involved in this. There'd been a couple of secretaries of the Navy who'd been interested in the Navy and done something. Now, Roosevelt was in a very different situation. First of all, he, he is what we might call with some qualifications an imperialist. At a time when theorists like Admiral Mahan had argued that the projection of world power, of power in the world, must be through naval power. And um, he had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy for a little less than a year, admittedly. And he'd written a, a little book, his first book on the naval warfare of 1812. So he had this long interest in the Navy. So he enters the presidency, and he becomes, he, he, he becomes something that looks unlike anything we'd ever seen. Not like an assistant secretary, like a secretary of the Navy, not like an admiral. He manages, he managed the Navy. So he changed fleet tactics, in fact, there had not been fleet tactics. He ordered there be fleet level and squadron level um, exercises. He um, became an innovator with something, and this really is picayune, so to speak, but important. He became an innovator of um, gunnery practice on American ships, er, absolutely adamant that American gunnery accuracy must improve. He was involved in the choice of the technical question of armor in American ships. And then most importantly, he, in, the, in the wake of Britain building the great dreadnought, this revolution in battleships, he did something that Congress didn't want to do, 
the older, the more senior parts of the Navy didn't want to do, which was to match Dreadnought with, an Ameri with a great American battleship, which was called the all-big-gun battleship. And he won. And he won because he was able to circumvent these key policymakers. Traditionally, policy for the Navy was made in congressional committees. And Roosevelt circumvented them. Now, how did this happen? Why did, how could he do this? And the answer is simple, but, 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 not, but, but, not, but, but not visible. He developed a proto-staff. He developed, in other words, a group of people who were not tied to him, who were not part of the White House, but were young, modernizing officers in the Navy who were very, very discontented. He had met some of them as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And so he developed direct lines of communication with officers who were committed to battleship development, improved gunnery practice, et cetera, and he used their information to leverage change. That sounds a lot like a modern president, but a modern president does that with a staff, with, for example, the National Security Council or the, um, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and their staffs. But Roosevelt has none of that. So he, he, he improvises a staff system to effect great change. Now, and of course, the bottom line on that story is, uh, the, is, is, is the Great White Fleet. So, I mean, this is a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful end to the naval case. So at the very end of his presidency, Roosevelt decided, and we, were, we, we had diplomatic troubles with, with Japan, and Roosevelt wanted to project American power generally. He decides he's going to send the Atlantic fleet to the Pacific. That itself was a great challenge because there was no Panama Canal yet. It was around, the, it was around a very dangerous um, southern course uh, below uh, South America. And then when, oh, oh, the ships were painted white. And then when they got to the Pacific, he ordered them to go further around the world. No fleet had ever done this of modern ships. So it was this, it was this utterly striking fact. The United States was sending the, the contemporary version of, think of ICBMs or Strategic Air Command on a route that had never been done before. We had arrived. We, We'd beaten Spain, but beating Spain was like kicking sand into the eyes of kindergartners. It was already the sick man of Europe. But now we put ourselves on the stage with more than France and Italy, with Germany and England, Japan as well. We'd become a major power. And poetically, the great white fleet returns as Roosevelt leaves the presidency. and He goes out on a ship to greet them coming back into Chesapeake Bay, and that ends Roosevelt's presidency. What I want to do now, as a kind of coda to this, is to, to, to use a kind of natural experiment. So is it the man? Is it the context? How do we weigh each? Well, we do have a way of testing part of that. Roosevelt chose his own successor, didn't he? William Howard Taft was the man Roosevelt wanted in the presidency. He, had, he was Roosevelt's Secretary of War. He himself had had a distinguished career. Roosevelt said of Taft that he was, while Taft was, was in his cabinet, he's one of the two most accomplished public servants he's ever met. The other was, was Root, who had been Secretary of War before Taft. And so Taft was the perfect successor. And what Roosevelt said was that in choosing Taft as president, he was going to succeed himself. Taft would continue his presidency. And Taft understood that. He was going to be a Roosevelt. And, well, he was going to continue the Roosevelt policies. Admittedly, Taft was going to be a different man. But they were, they, they were of one mind about this. Well, Roosevelt left the presidency. Taft, of course, won the election of 1908. Roosevelt took his gun and went to Africa to kill some animals, and then go to Europe afterwards to give some speeches in foreign languages. And so he was gone for most of that next year. 
Taft was in the presidency, and Taft got into serious trouble. So not only didn't he fully continue the Roosevelt policies, but he fired Roosevelt's best friend in the government, uh, uh, Gifford Pinchot, the head of the Forest Service. And so in, in what was a battle beyond description, this became one of the great battles of the progressive period, the pinchot ballinger dispute, with big congressional hearings and all kinds of newspaper articles, all of which made Taft look like a dolt. But in fact, he really wasn't, and probably, had, was, and probably was right in his judgments in this conflict. But as, as, so Roosevelt was out of the presidency. And here's a cartoon that suggests the way Roosevelt's leave-taking was seen. So here's a president who had spent all of his time pacing back and forth and with, with people who would um, copy his words and turn that into law or turn that into new books or turn it into letters and speeches. In other words, the presidency as a, a machine that never stops. Well, nobody thought Taft was a machine that never stopped once he entered the presidency. So another cartoon. Um, same cartoonist. Um, the, the text is small, but so I'll describe it a bit to you. So these are a bunch of reporters who are standing around. And they're talking to each other, the balloons. And they're saying, I haven't had a story to file in months. Or I just filed a story. It's the first one this year. In other words, government wasn't doing anything. Again, picking up this theme that Taft was a different kind of president. Now. Just a, 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 by way of footnote on this, there's a lot of ways in which Taft, in fact, continued the Roosevelt policies. He was a much more active pursuer of antitrust than, than a Roosevelt was. For all of his battle with Gifford Pinchot, the conservationist, Taft maintained conservation policies, by and large, that were Rooseveltian. But he could not maintain the politics of it. So what I want to show you is, um, two things. The first is, so finally, a kind of a last thought about Roosevelt, which um, published in the Washington Post. The Washington Post's assessment of Roosevelt being quite consistent with the way we're talking about him. He establishes a new claim upon the esteem and confidence of the American people. He'll be regarded as the champion of the oppressed, as the chief magistrate has substituted action for the hair-splitting platitudes of the past, a new kind of president. Well, Taft couldn't be that. And um, Roosevelt, after being away for almost a year, came back from Europe on this ship. And the ship was coming into the harbor, and poor Taft sent Roosevelt this letter. This is an excerpt from the letter. So he, he was trying to communicate to, 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 to Roosevelt that he felt bad about not being Roosevelt. So what does he say? Um, I did not follow up my letter delivered by Archie Butt to you on the steamer. He sent a letter as Roosevelt was leaving almost a year earlier. Um, for reasons I did not wish to invite your comment or judgment on matters at long range while Roosevelt was abroad or to commit you in respect to issues that you ought perhaps only reach a decision upon after your return. That's the Gifford Pinchot, Pinchot issue. And so he says, as it is now a year and three months since I assumed office, and I have had a hard time. I do not know that I have had a harder luck than other presidents, but I do know that thus far I have succeeded far less than have others. So Taft is telling his predecessor I've blown it. I'm, I'm, I'm feckless. I mean, this, this, this is an act of such abnegation, of such psychological servitude in some way. But it, it, it reflects, I think, the, the point simply that I want to make, that this, is, this gives us evidence that it is a set of skills in a context, and not just the context, that elevates Roosevelt into a distinctive kind of president. So in that sense, the man met the time and gave us 
an unusual moment in presidential history. Um, uh, remind you of, uh, there have been earlier insights on that issue. So scripture and Machiavelli, the good and the bad maybe. So um, the race is not to the swift, Ecclesiastes, um, but not yet favored to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. So what happens to us is a function of, the, of time, context. And Machiavelli pointed out, um, I believe the prince will be successful who directs his actions according to the spirit of the times. And so it, it, it's not inconsistent with what we understand in political theory or our understanding of leadership generally, that to understand Roosevelt, we must understand his context. And not surprisingly, since he is an intellectual, um, Roosevelt understood this. So finally, some words of his from 1910. If there is not the war, you don't get the great general. If there is not a great occasion, you don't get a great statesman. If Lincoln had lived in a time of peace, no one would have known his name. If Roosevelt hadn't succeeded by luck of an assassin's bullet, McKinley, at the opening of the Progressive Era, we would not know Roosevelt. But he did succeed McKinley, and he had the toolkit for the right moment, and we well know Roosevelt. We're here tonight. Well, thank you. Let's talk about Roosevelt. Much. We, I'm sure the audience has some questions for you. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, please just raise your hand and then stand up and speak boldly. Let me ask you a first question to get things started. So Roosevelt retires on March 4, 1909 and goes off on a year-long safari and the grand tour of Europe. Had he stayed in the United States, either at Oyster Bay or Washington, D.C., so that he could have helped Taft, how things might have been different? Um, it's, it's an interesting <coughs> question to think about. Um, but let me respond with, a, with an initial question. Um, Taft differed from Roosevelt in his relationship with the uh, key, leader, key leaders of his party in Congress. It was much more comfortable with them that Roosevelt wound up in his second term being. He was also a person whose own, whose own history, his family history, was much more orthodoxly artisan than Roosevelt's. And so the problem Roosevelt would have had if he was here was that he remains very sensitive to the winds of the time, yet Taft's propensity was to be pulled into um, a stable relationship with the stand pat Republicans. Um, he didn't want to be. The, the, a, a case that I treat in my book uh, in this regard is Taft's attempt to reform the tariff, to, to lower levels of the tariff. He, he had the absolutely, and, and quite courageous, bright goals. He just couldn't maintain it. Once he got resistance from the stand patters, he just folded because he didn't want to break with the party leadership. And so I think that Roosevelt's presence wouldn't have helped very much. So that's my take on that question. But I mean, if, if you, he writes that, that letter to Roosevelt saying, essentially, I haven't faced any difficulties greater than other presidents have faced, but for some reason I've failed. Wouldn't Roosevelt have been able to buck him up on at, at those occasions and say, you're going to have to break with the old stalwarts? And I'm, not, I'm not sure, because Roosevelt's lesson, I mean, we talked about this at dinner, Roosevelt's lesson to Taft, while Taft was the chairman, was that you can work with Speaker Kent, you can work with Aldrich, majority leader of the Senate. Um, they're fundamentally good guys, even though they're crooks. In other words, and that's, Rose, that's Roosevelt. That is, there's this kind of, there's always a double take. And so I think Roosevelt's teaching to Taft would be incomprehensible to Taft. Taft is, too, in some sense, I don't mean stupid, but simple-minded. Can't maintain that. Straightforward, that. right. Let's take some questions. Who has a question for Perry Arnold? Please raise your hand. If I miss you, yes, please speak up. Uh, 
Dr. Arnold in uh, 1907 while TR is hunting bear in Louisiana. Uh, a run is made on Wall Street, certain trusts are failing, and his nemesis, J.P. Morgan, orchestrates uh, uh, the saving of, of some of these trusts, and specifically, uh, Carnegie purchases the stock of Tennessee Iron and Coal Company and increases uh, his domestic uh, uh, share of steel production. Just your comments and how you read the, the presidential allowance for this. Well, it's about uh, the panic it, of With yeah, regards to his antitrust I mean, legacy. Your last phrase is, is really key to this. That is, this wasn't happening behind Roosevelt's back. Roosevelt had encouraged taking over Tennessee Iron and Coal. And, uh, as a, and then there's this complicated stock deal that then strengthens the market because there's a major stock firm that was failing because of the panic and had a lot of stock in Tennessee Iron Coal. Um, so it was kind of like, what, 2008, but, two, but 19, instead. Um, and the bailout is a private bailout, right? So it's J.P. Morgan bailing out the, the financial system rather than the U.S. government. Um, Roosevelt was a pragmatist. He saw a way to get to, 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 to solve the problem. He sent his Secretary of Commerce in the middle of the panic to J.P. Morgan to meet with the bankers in New York to try to encourage them to provide liquidity and take over some of the risk. See, the problem at that point is we don't have a, we don't have a Federal Reserve yet, so that there is no real capacity for the Federal Government to do what it did last year. And so the, this sophisticated, for the time, president, who understood what a panic looked like, I think understood that somebody had to be mobilized to essentially start throwing money into the hole. And J.P. Morgan and other bankers did that, and then Carnegie and Tennessee Coal and Iron. Now, um, but you remember, there's a, there is a follow-up in the story, Taft then, accuses Carnegie of antitrust. And Tennessee Iron Co. is the is, is the crime committed. And that utterly enraged TR. Because he had permitted it. He yeah, heard. yeah, yeah. So but you know the bottom line of the story is, and I treat this in my book, is is 13, um, uh, 13 and and Wilson and the Federal Reserve. It was the 1907 experience that made it clear to everybody that the Whatever it looked like, there had to be a central bank. A lot of fighting over what the bank would be, but there had to be such a bank. And Wilson gets one um, put in place. Another extraordinarily successful president. But you know, it goes back to what you said about Roosevelt, and I know you were slightly exaggerated, but they're crooks, but we can deal with them. They're good mm -hmm. guys. He lets Morgan save the economy, yeah, even yeah. though they're, in a certain sense, they're enemies, but he trusts Morgan to do the right thing. Yeah, well, it, famously, there's another moment in which, um, I forget the case, but um, Roosevelt is uh, publicly accusing Morgan of some uh, improprieties. And Morgan's response, he sends a message, um, I'll, send, I'll send my people to meet with your people. That's right, okay. the security. Oh, that's, okay, that's right. And as if, uh, you know, I'm a sovereignty and I'll meet with you as a sovereignty. And Roosevelt just brushed him aside. Um, but he understood, that, look, look, Roosevelt understood power. And he understood the economy. And so these, this, the, the 1907 case, I think, is one that illustrates how subtle he was and willing to deal with the devil. If, if J.P. Morgan was the devil. To get the job. Yeah, I don't think he actually thought of it was the devil. Other questions? Yes, here, speak up, please. Yes, do. All right. The, the information is that they, uh, right now we talk of Ted Cruz, but then he was a great leader. I want to know to what extent did his success at Tuck contribute to Roosevelt's success? Because if Tuck was a great leader, if he had done everything that needed to be done, would we be still be talking about Roosevelt and how great it is? That's a good question. If Taft had been a much more successful president, would we be talking so praisefully about Roosevelt? Um, the, the nice thing about questions that can't be answered factually is <laughs> that I can't be wrong. Can I? Um, yeah, I think that we would we would speak of Roosevelt in very similar ways 
uh, but we speak of tax differently. And these three presidents of the progressive era would then, if tactically successful, uh, whatever that means, um, uh, we would see Roosevelt, perhaps even more positively, establishing a line of, 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 of executive presidents who had leveraged power in a way that had never uh, been leveraged before. But with tax failure, Roosevelt increasingly looks like a singleton, looks like a one-off, with tax failure right after him. And, and Wilson's leadership being founded on very different grounds, very different kind of, uh, of political strategy. So, B.V. Roosevelt is something of a one-off president. Good question. Other questions? Yes, here, please speak up. Yeah, what, what gave you your interest in Theodore Roosevelt in your first place? Um, there's probably some funny answers I could give to that. Get right about something. Do those first. Um, but the uh, uh, through my, much of my more, almost all my scholarship has been uh, on uh, the American executive branch in the 20th century. So, and I, I'm interested in the development of the executive branch, how an institution goes from here to here. Time. And through that work, in some way, I always saw over my shoulder, looking into the past, that there was this puzzling period in the early 20th century when presidents seemed to behave differently than their predecessors. And I didn't understand why. And so that led me then to start work on the progressive period in the executive branch. And um, which, and increasingly in that, pro in, in that work, I began to realize I got to know more about these individuals as personalities and as skill sets. So I started. So as a result, I got enmeshed in Theodore Roosevelt. But that wasn't my original aim. My aim was understanding the institution and understanding change. Other questions? Yes. Yes, here, please, Carrie. Well, one point that's been argued about the Christmas the Ob Ob Obama campaign recently was his taking advantage of the internet as a way of uh, promoting his political cause. And we could say that Kennedy is lauded for his embracing television in a way that his predecessors had not. Do you think that Theodore Roosevelt was also revolutionary in his harnessing of the media? And if so, yeah. how? Harnessing the emerging technology for yeah. communication. Yeah. I think that, that's a really good question, generic. That is, I think it's really important to think about um, new movements, politically, but all, and, and new sort of innovations of leadership in, among other things, uh, relationship to media. I think it's likely that, just as a hypothesis, that change in media, new technologies in media, are uh, in some ways prerequisite to new political movements, new forms of leadership. Yeah, and for Roosevelt, it's the uh, rise in the several decades before of these major commercial newspapers, no longer merely partisan, but uh, particularly the quality papers serving the middle class, like the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and, um, and maybe more importantly, the National Magazine, uh, which found muckraking to be a very profitable business. And so fueling the fire of reform and radicalizing the middle class. So yeah, I don't. I think without that kind of, um, of communications technology, Roosevelt would not have had the political reach he had. So it, that is an important part of the story. And, and within those emerging media, the cartoon and the right. photograph, right? right? Unprecedented. Right. And the film footage too. Yeah, yeah, in early form, yeah. Other questions? I have one for you. Am I missing something? If I'm not, I have one for you about context. You said at the beginning of your lecture something very interesting. You said McKinley, for all of his qualities as a Civil War veteran and so on, could not recognize the context. So what was it about Roosevelt that enabled him yeah. to recognize the context? Yeah. Um, let me qualify what I said just a bit. He record, McKinley recognized a different context, the context that was established in, of, the, of, of the, the, the political power structure 
of the party period post-Civil War. Um, and the reason that, we can, that Roosevelt is so much more sensitive to claims of reform is, I mean, there's several. The first is this administrative background of his. I mean, his first administrative appointment was to the Civil Service Commission, the first real civil service commission. In other words, his job was to clean up the mess made by patriotic politics. And then he was, high, he was brought to New York, to the New York Police Commission, because a reform mayor wanted to try to clean up the corrupt New York police force. So that this, this experience, not in elected political roles, serving party, but rather in roles of the state as a set of administrative structures, gave him much greater sensitivity to the goals of reformers than McKinley could have had. McKinley's commitment was to use patronage to support the party and to raise as much money as possible for the party. So they try this metaphor. It's as if they saw different contexts because they were wearing different glasses, different lenses and saw the world differently. But Roosevelt saw the world as a place that needed to be reformed. It was his background. Right. He was trained to be a reformer. And so, but add to that is the fact that he is, his background is aristocratic. And the sort, the, the, not just aristocratic, he comes from a family of significant money, but a family that, that is of the Knickerbockers. That is, that informally, that group called the Knickerbockers who disdained the very rich, um, who saw the Vanderbilts, um, at, for example, as kind of the nouveau rich. Uh, these were the people of the Hudson River aristocracy. They, were, they knew how to use money, and they were modest. And so he, he could look at the new um, capitalism and think there was much that was wrong with it. And, and he wrote a lot about that. So he was very skeptical about the trusts and, and business greed. So he had a mental set as well, a value set, that made him um, quite, um, uh, quite prone to see and be sensitive to the claims for reform. Right man at the right time. Other questions? Yes, please. Um, some uh, words that have uh, come up in the last few uh, questions. Um, uh, I'd like to ask about um, uh, Roosevelt um, uh, not only uh, coming uh, to the uh, president um, uh, with the presidency with a um, uh, different um, uh, still, skill set, it's also uh, to a certain extent you can look at him as the um, uh, first, certainly a uh, technocrat of his times, and a um, uh, both a um, uh, social scientist and a um, uh, mm -hmm. biological uh, scientist, yeah, and yeah. that's a um, uh, long yeah. way from the uh, party presidency that yeah, yeah, so, came earlier. Uh, yeah, he you know, he, he brings with him, um, well, I mean, you've said it well, a, a totally different background than the party period presidents. And um, is he a social scientist? Well, he really isn't, but a historian he is. He was an educated man and curious and omnivorous about learning, meaning that he understood that there's a relationship between problems and information. And he knew how to get information. And that makes him extremely different than prior presidents. We have time for a couple more. So, yes, go ahead. Um, this is all really fascinating, and it's really fun to hear your thoughts on Roosevelt. I wondered about uh, the legacy of 1896 when the, the both parties almost split. You know, there were silver Republicans and gold Republicans and silver Democrats and gold Democrats. And, and that part of Roosevelt's smartness was in seeing that split and seeing that he could kind of play both ends of the spectrum in a sense. And so I wondered if, to put it sort of more provocatively, you know, the populace, some populists saw Brian as taking their agenda and going light with it mm -hmm, yeah, to yeah. get votes. And I wonder if, in a sense, Roosevelt took Brianism yeah. and made it light. Brian the question is about the legacy of 1896. Yeah, well, Brian thought that. Brian writes in 1804 that, every, that he, everything was stolen from him um, as he runs against Roosevelt. Um, the, um, yeah, yeah, 18. 
I'm not easy in, 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 in dealing with this because you're, you're actually right. 1996 is, is really a critical moment. Um, and it is, it, 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 it reshuffles the electorate in some ways. Um, and it's the last best chance, it may be populism light, but it's the last best chance of populism and it loses. Um, but part of, the, part of the question then becomes, as I understand it, is so how does some of the populist agenda morph into and find appeal in the progressive agenda? Uh, and which is another way of seeing that when Brian in the early 20th century saw these Republican reformers co-opting his agenda, he was enraged by it and didn't know what to do about it, but he understood something strange had gone on. And um, now, at one and the same time, what I, what I think is important to also underline is that um, Roosevelt was, was issue-oriented, uh, problem-oriented, but he had no ambition to speak to Democrats. Um, because one of the things that remains interesting to me about Roosevelt is how traditionally partisan he was. So that if he could draw some Democratic votes in Congress, that's fine. But he, let me, let me use uh, uh, an opposite case that's similar in time. Clearly, Wilson saw realignment as a goal for 1916. That is, Wilson looked at the 1912 results. He, is, he won with about 42% of the vote, Democratic vote. But there was the second candidate, was TR. If you put the progressive vote and the Democratic vote together, you create a majority party. Wilson understood that and sought to mix the vote up to create a new progressive majority in 1916. That would have been foreign to Roosevelt, who is, it was, was endlessly prone to talk about the importance of party loyalty, even though it was a hamper in some ways. So I'm not so sure that Roosevelt fully understood the implications of 1896. And I think that he had a partisan blinker that confined him a bit from seeing that, from asking something like the following, maybe everything's been thrown up for grabs. I, I don't think he could have seen that. Let's do one well, more, and I have a question for you. Yes, here. Well, I rather took a bridge at your comment of, uh, that Roosevelt was trained to be a reformer rather than a spontaneity on his part. Would you? The question is, was, was he trained to be a reformist or did it come from said. his spontaneous character in the sense of the world? You use the phrase. The yeah, phrase yeah. The phrase. Then, but what I mean by that is that what we are is how we're formed. That Roosevelt's um, decision in 1902 to try to use and essentially push forward antitrust policy in the Northern Securities case um, didn't come from some spiritual place. It came from a set of political experiences that he had in his career that, that, so that he was shaped to, to do that by his experience. It's true, in other words. Now, I don't think uh, Roosevelt was, and I don't think any politician is, um, is a naturally gifted actor who acts out of some great inspiration. I think you've got to have a skill set to do it. But by trying, you don't mean that he was handled by handling. Oh, no, 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 I don't mean that he was a monkey. I mean rather that his own background shaped him, gave him the training the way a skilled surgeon has training to do surgery as opposed to just taking up a knife and being inspired. <laughs> I would look beyond that. I'm going to ask Sharon to go for a minute to give some announcements. Let me ask you one last question. I have many more, and I know the audience does too, who will have some other chances to, to, to ask you questions in the next couple of days. But I want to ask you a question about Roosevelt's luck, or what appears to be luck. If at any, you mentioned a number of key cases, Northern Securities, the Great White Fleet, one could add the Russo-Japanese War, the Anthracite Coal Strike, the Alaska Boundary Settlement. If, if those had failed, if Northern Securities had backfired, he'd lost. If his um, intervention in the Anthracite Coal case had been a humiliation. If 
with the um, Great White Fleet had broken down. I mean, he, he was a very yeah. fortunate man for the boldness yeah. that he showed, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, but you know that's uh, political success is in part a, um, a piece of lucky results of boldness. Um, sure, but I think we could go through that list in a longer list and identify <coughs> some of Roosevelt's failures or, 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 or very modest successes rather than full successes and see how quickly he could brush aside um, uh, his, 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 uh, a result that wasn't the result he aimed at. Uh, he was a resilient politician. Another factor, I think, of successful politicians is they get, they brush, they get up and brush themselves off and go off to embarrass themselves again. <laughs> and Roosevelt certainly had that. <laughs> Professor Perry Arnold of Notre Dame. to our symposium. We'll begin again tomorrow at 9. We hope you all come back. If you haven't registered, there's still time. There will be a book.